That's your prayer this morning? Is that your prayer this morning? Hear us from heaven. Touch our generation. Is that the cry of your heart? I look around at you. Go ahead and be seated. And, and there are generations represented here. And oh, that every generation would cry out to God and say, God, we need you. Hear us from heaven. Touch this generation. Turn the course of our nation. Touch us. If you're visiting with us this morning, welcome. I am not the pastor. I am a substitute. Um, our pastor is away at seminary this weekend. Um, church, let's be in prayer for those who are finishing up what was to be, I think, a very intense four days of training, um, that God would, would seal it up and bring them safely home to their families, back into our church family. Pray with me this morning. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak of you this day. And God, I give back to you what you've given to me. Lord, my desire is that your kingdom would be advanced and the name of Jesus Christ would be lifted up. Spirit, I pray, as I prayed already today with others, that you would stir up the soil of a soul of our hearts and minds, that, God, we be prepared to receive from you what you have for us this day. And to you belong all glory and honor in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so here we are, that, that week between weeks. Last week was it, wasn't it, for you Seahawk fans? And you Bronco fan. <laughs> Over the past few weeks, more than a few of us have watched with joy the progress of the Seahawks making their way to the playoffs. And I'm sure that a number of you look forward to next week when they get to play in the Super Bowl. Now, like a lot of you, I had a chance, um, my rabid Facebook, I mean, my avid Facebook Seahawk fans have posted lots of things about the Seahawks. And I've, I've picked up a few of those videos and I've listened to some of the interviews with players and coaches, and one of the things that I've heard a couple of different times was that they've been working toward this since the start of the preseason. That goes way back to last July. So for over six months, they've been conditioning their bodies and their minds to go the distance. And as I was praying, asking the Lord, what, what would you have me share this day? That's the message that came to my mind, and it wasn't the Seahawks. It was going the distance, going the distance. And it's that I want to talk about this morning. And I, and I think that far too often people stumble through their spiritual life. They experience ups and they experience downs, and they're uncertain whether or not they can go the distance. And I've had the pleasure and at times the frustration of, of praying with people who just seem to sputter at times and, and can't go the distance or seemingly won't go the distance. So this morning, I just want to see what the Lord would have to say. You know, there are people who wonder if, if following Christ is worth the effort that they make because they don't see a lot of progress. And, and that pains me because too often the enemy short circuits the walk of, of a number of believers because they, they, they can't get beyond the fact that it's a struggle. I don't know who ever told believers that following Jesus Christ would be easy. It's not a message I ever, ever spoke, and it's not a message that I ever believed. Um, Ted Turner, you all know Ted Turner, the, the rich guy who, who runs TBS, and I think he owned or owned the Atlanta Braves and, and a whole other bunch of things. He divorced a woman because she became a Christian. And he said, I can't, I can't have anything to do with Christians because they're weak and they need a crutch. And I say, amen, that's me. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do need Jesus Christ. And I can't make it without him, and I'm not ashamed to admit that. All that I'm able to do, I do because of Jesus Christ. There, there's nothing in me that, that allows me to go the distance. On the opposite side of those who, who stumble at times and, and seemingly give up, there are those who have been raised in the church from the time that they were very little people, and it's become a part of their life. It's, it's what they do. They're conditioned into it, and yet there's no meaning in it. It's just another thing that they do, like changing the sheets on once a week and going to the grocery store once a week. It's just something that we do. We go to church. But if, if it's not based on a relationship with Jesus Christ, then you're missing something. N no, no, I'm, you're missing everything. You're missing the full deal. Now, how many of us have come to the place in our life with our relationship with Jesus, he's something that we cannot and something we will not live without? 
Have you reached that point? I cannot and I will not go one more step without Jesus Christ. Is he just a crutch or is he the crutch? Is he just a tool that gets you through sometimes? Or is he the driving force that allows you to get through day by day by day? How many of us will sell everything or sacrifice everything we have for Jesus Christ? We haven't had to do that here in America, have we? We're pretty free to worship however we want to worship. But, but again, if you, if you look at the voice of the martyrs and other groups, there are people dying for their faith. There are people dying just because they name the name of Jesus. They, they, they make a, a decision for Christ. They barely get up off their knees and walk out and go home, and they're dead because they chose Jesus Christ. We have not had to suffer to that point, beloved. But if you would have to, would you? Would you sell out if your life was on the line? I'm reading a book, and, and, and the chapter I'm in right now is talking about Peter and, and Peter's betrayal of Jesus. Peter was, was probably Jesus' best friend on the earth. Walked with him, lived with him, shared every facet of life with him for three years. But when push came to shove and Peter's life might have been on the line, Peter sold out. You know why Peter sold out? It's because he had not prepared himself in advance for that moment. So right here, right now, today, if you haven't prepared yourself for that moment, I challenge you to do that. Because there will come a time, I will bet you, for every one of us, where we get into a situation where we have a choice. Go with the crowd or defend the name of Jesus Christ. It may cost you favor. It may cost you a job promotion. It may cost you relationships. But what's the alternative? What did Jesus say to those who denied him? I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. That's scary, church. That's a scary statement he made. How many of us will sell everything and sacrifice everything? How many of us are willing to go the distance to obtain the upward call of God in Christ Jesus? Going the distance. Look with me at Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. And we're going to see Paul's position. This is Paul's pre-Super Bowl interview. He says, yet indeed I count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not my own righteousness, which is by, from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, know the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. He counts everything as loss. Paul had everything. He was a Pharisee's Pharisee. He was at the top of the pile. Gave it all up. And here's a man who traded his time. He traded his wealth. He traded his relationships for Jesus Christ. Sold all of it, and he says, I've counted them as what? Rubbish. He had it all. He had fame and wealth and position and power and notoriety. He'd attained it. He'd reached the top. And he let it all go. He let all of it go and traded that for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now look at verses 12 to 14 in the same chapter. Here's a guy who traded everything, and what does he say? I have not yet attained it. I'm not perfect, but I press on. I press on. I keep going. I'm striving to go the distance that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. That's an amen. I don't count myself to have apprehended it. One thing I do, I forget those things that are behind, and I reach forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal. What's the prize? The upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's what I'm after. He doesn't consider that he reached it. 
He says, I'm pressing on. And part of that process of pressing on and going the distance for him is letting go of the past. The things that were in his past. He did not spend a whole lot of his time regretting looking back at the things that he had done. Yes, if you've read his letters, you will know he made reference to them. He made reference to them to draw people to Christ, not to put himself in the muck and mire, but to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Paul did not stay under the oppression of the things that he had done. Paul was a murderer. But he had left that behind. He let nothing in his past, which was where? His past was, my favorite phrase, under the blood. Powerless. Powerless to do him any harm unless he chose to let it do him harm. He was a single-focused, single-minded man where Jesus was concerned. One thought always in Paul's life, Jesus. He probably whispered it, spoke it, screamed it, praised it. Every way possible, you would have heard Paul saying, Jesus, Jesus. Paul had set himself. Paul had determined, I'm going the distance. I know him who's called me. I know where I'm going. I'm letting it all go. And people, it'll take that determination on our part. Our walk with Jesus isn't a sprint. It's more like a marathon. You try to sprint it, you crash and burn. There's no other way around it. I tried it. Believe me, I've tried it and tried it and tried it. It doesn't work. One of the things I've learned about a marathon is that we need several things. I've been walking with Christ for over 30 years now, and I've learned a few things about this marathon that I'm on. We need a skill set. We need the tools, and we need the foundation. One of my coworkers is a runner, and her goal this year in 2014 is to run 14 half marathons. That's 13 miles at a pop. That means she does a little bit more than one a month. A bunch of the rest of us in the office, we're going to do 14 5Ks, which is 3.1 miles. That's nothing compared to what she's doing. But Chris is a serious runner. She's been doing it for many years, and she's got the skill set. She's conditioned her body. She's conditioned her mind to take the pounding that you get when you run mile after mile after mile. She also has the tools. She's got the right shoes, shoes that are fitted just for her feet. And she's got specific clothes that she wears that, that keep her warm and cold, but don't let her get so hot that she overheats while she's running. She's counted the cost. She's made the sacrifice. She's, she's built herself a foundation for success. Now, as Christians, what are we doing? What are we doing? Our walk demands the same thing of us. If we plan to go the distance with Jesus Christ, our walk demands the same thing. If you hope to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of you, then you need a skill set. And God has given you the skill set. It's just yours to take that skill set to yourself and to begin to use it. It's there and it's available to us. One of the most basic things for us to understand is that we are not created to survive, but to thrive. We've got to get that in our head. I have met way too many Christians who just say, I've got to get there. I just have to get there. I have to gut it out and get there. Where do you find that in Scripture? I just have to get through to heaven. I have to do just what's necessary so that I measure up. Where is that in Scripture? I've read through this thing probably more than a dozen times. I've yet to see where it says you sign on a dotted line and then you just hang on for the ride. I don't see that. That's totally the opposite of what I read about discipleship. You think about, you know, people think about it, I've got to say the right things, I've got to be in the right place, I've got to maintain the right thoughts. I've got to live a life based on works. I've got to measure up by what I do, what I say, what I think, how I act. People who strive to do that crash and burn. They are not able to go the distance because they're going to find out it doesn't work. Works don't work. Not for salvation. Not for a relationship. Our walk, according to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, 
is by grace. You are saved by grace through faith, not of yourself, not by works that you have nothing to boast in. I have one thing in which I can boast, and that's Jesus Christ. I have him because he has me. And I can and I will boast in that. I'm strong, I'm determined, I'm tenacious, but without him, I'm nothing. I'm a failure waiting to happen. Our walk is based on grace, willingly accepting what Jesus Christ offered to us, and then living a life based on that relationship. Christianity is a relationship. It's nothing more than that. If we hope to do more than just get by, if we hope to thrive, then we better equip ourselves with the tools that we need for the journey. And we have got to make sure that we have a stable foundation. You all know Jesus' parable, the guy who built his house on the sand and the guy who built the house on the rock. The guy who had the unstable foundation, the first storm that came along, washed it out. Life is full of storms. How many of you face storms in your life? Yes. There's been illness, there have been struggles financially, there's been struggles, you know, all kinds of ways. We've all experienced them. We could have a testimony about them. But if your foundation is built on Christ, the storms don't take out the house. I stand in spite of my storms because my foundation is in Christ. I stand because he stands, and as long as he stands, I will stand. And that's enough. If you think about Paul's ministry, you remember right at the end of his life, he wrote a letter to Timothy. You turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, you're going to see one of the things that he was asking of Timothy. He wrote to Timothy seeking encouragement and support as, off, as well as offering Timothy words of counsel as, as a young pastor. And look what he asks in the middle of this letter. He says, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come. And the books, especially the parchments. Here's a guy in the dungeon. I was reading about that dungeon this week. They lowered him down to this place. It was dark, it was damp, and it probably was cold. And he wanted his coat. Bring the coat and the books, especially the parchments. Now, scholars believe among those were the Old Testament scriptures because they didn't have the New Testament. Paul was raised on the Old Testament scriptures, and he was asking, give me my Bible. They also believed that there were already, by that point, written words of Jesus. That probably was the parchments. People had, had written down on parchments the words and the teachings of Jesus Christ, and Paul had a copy, and he wanted those things. Now, what about you and I? What about you and I? If we find ourselves in, in prison, what would we be asking people to bring to us? What would we be needing to get through? Does the word of God have enough value to us that we can't or won't live without it? Have you personalized it? Is this truly my Bible? You know, when pastor's here and he does the pledge every week, what does he say? If you had the pleasure of sitting back by me and Cindy, you know, she'll hear every week, my Bible. That's how I say it, because this is mine. You all know it's mine because it's purple, right? If I ever lose it, I know it'll find its way back to me. Nobody else has purple duct tape on their Bible. But it's mine. It is. It's mine. And every word in it is mine. And if you open my Bible, of Genesis 1-1, what will you find? You all know. And at the end, at the end of Revelation, it says, it's personalized. It's mine. It's God's word to me. But what about you? Is this your word? I finally found out this week I'm reading a really good book. Who said that, that phrase that I've often used? A Bible that's falling apart generally belongs to a person who isn't. Well, that was Charles Spurgeon. And it's true. Take a moment, look at your Bible. What shape's your Bible in? I've seen Sister Vi's. Hers is worse off than mine. I've seen pastors, they've had to recover his. What's the shape of your Bible? It'll say a lot about you. Is it truly your Bible? Turn with me to Joshua chapter 1. We're going to look at God's charge to Joshua to find a few things about going the distance. Oh my goodness, that is really small. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law 
which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn to the right hand, don't turn to the left hand, that you might prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may be careful to observe to do according to all that's written in it. For then you'll make your way prosperous, and then you'll have good success. Wow. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Don't be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wow. That's a chunk of scripture that ought to be highlighted or underlined in your Bible. Because you can personalize that and make that God's word to you. God tells Joshua three things about the book of the law. He says it shouldn't depart from your mouth. He says that you're to meditate on it day and night. And that you're observed to do according to all that was written in it. Now, to make that command personal, in order for the word not to depart from our mouth, obviously, we have to speak it. If it's not going to depart from my mouth, I have to speak the word. I have to be so familiar with it that I can speak of it to myself, to people around me when they need to be encouraged. It's going to be in my mouth. I've got to know what it says. I can't talk about the words that are in here if I don't know what they are. A Bible laying on my table or laying on my shelf is no good. It's no good to me. It's like that gun I talk about in our house. I know there's a gun in our house because John has a gun. And it's in a safe, and I'm glad that it's there. But that gun is of zero use to me. As I told you before, the most I could do is point it at the right direction and hit somebody over the head with it. I don't know how to load it. I don't know where the safety is. I don't know how to shoot it. It would be no good to me. It's not a weapon of any use to me. The same is true of the Bible. If you're not using it, it's of no use to you. And you think that the enemy of your soul doesn't use this word? Doesn't know this word? He absolutely does, and he wants to twist it. Go back to Genesis. You'll see what he did in the Garden of Eden. He took God's spoken word to Adam and Eve, and he twisted it. And he ruined history for the rest of us. He'll do the same thing with you he did to Adam and Eve if you're not watchful. You've got to get the word into you that you might be able to speak it, that it would not depart from your mouth. To be so familiar with it, so familiar with it, it doesn't leave you. That means you spend time with it on a daily basis, not once a week, not even twice a week, not even three if you come to discipleship on Monday nights. Every day. Every day. Day in, day out, one after another after another, reading the word reading the word, spending time in it, reading it, and letting it read you. Because that's what it will do. The word is alive and it's active and it will read you. It will begin to speak to you. And then I would say even go so far as to commit it to memory. Put some of that word to memory. Ties right into the second part of God's command, to meditate on it day and night. To meditate means nothing more than to think on something. Chew it over in your mind. Roll it and roll it and roll it in your mind again and again. Meditate on it. Think about it. Now, do you ever think to ask the Holy Spirit to lead you when you sit down and read the Bible? Or do you just grab it and open it up and point your finger to the first place that you are and read? Have you ever considered saying, oh, Spirit, please, Holy Spirit, lead me and teach me as I read your word. Give me new truth for this day for this moment. He longs to do that. What did Jesus say the Spirit would come to do? But to teach and to lead and to guide and to direct us into all truth. So I challenge you, before you break the word open, if you're a morning person, ask the Holy Spirit. Reveal yourself to me today. Teach me through your word. Show me what it is that you want me to have today. And if you seek his direction, he will. If you'll get quiet, Read a passage and just get quiet and let the Lord begin to minister to you. He longs to speak to you. Remember what I've taught you? Two ears, one mouth. Listen twice as much as you talk. <laughs> to just get quiet and say, go ahead, Spirit, teach me. The Bible's not just a good piece of literature to, to be read and to be set aside. I like to read lots of things and have lots of books that I'm reading at all times. But most of them, when I finish reading them on my Kindle, I knock them out of my carousel. I don't want to see them anymore. I read them. I don't need them there. There's only one book that stayed in my, in my Kindle carousel since the time it was handed to me, and that's the Bible. The rest of them, they just go away. 
I don't need them. They're good literature, and I, and I learn things, and I enjoy them. But they aren't the guiding force of my life. And there's the difference, not just to set it aside. It's God's personal message to you. God wrote you a love letter. It's your Bible. It's your word. Something worth pausing and thinking about. The final part of God's command is to observe to do according to all that is written it. Now, in our everyday speak, that might be, be sure you do what it says. When that passage is to be, to be careful to observe to do according to all that is written in it. God often spoke in Bible speak. I'll speak in everyday speak. Church, when you read the word of God, be sure you do what it says. Yes. It means we read the word with the intent to apply it, to put it into action, everything it tells us to do. Let's just take a really familiar one. When Jesus was asked what's the greatest commandment, what did he say? You kind of got it there. It all rumbled in different things. <laughs> Love the Lord you got with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and your neighbors, yourself. Okay. Great passage, right? How do I apply that? Hmm. How do I apply that? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Well, let's, first, let's talk about love. What does love mean? It means there's great affection. It means I put the, the object of my love in front of myself. Huh. In my life. Where's God? Is his desire in front of my desire? We just finished a 21-day fast. Congratulations. God be praised. I can't wait to see what he does now with that tithe. But those of you who participated did just that. You put God first. Remember talking with Samuel there night, and he said, you know, this fasting stuff is tough. He said, but I'm finding that I've got time for God I didn't have before. What a gift. Okay, so love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. Wow, what does that mean? What's got to change in my life today if I'm going to live that word and apply it? What's going to be different today from yesterday if I truly love God and put his desires <clears throat> and his will and his purposes in front of my own. That's what it means to read with the intent to apply. And I've read through it enough times to know that there is no shortage of things for you to learn to apply. But you have to purpose in your heart to do that. You have to choose to want to apply it, to put it into action. The Word of God is one of the tools that we have that help us go the distance. But again, it's no good if you don't use it. We also see in looking at that passage that God repeatedly tells Joshua two things. Remember what they were? He says it over and over again. Be strong and courageous. Challenge you to get a concordance and look up the word courage or any form of courage, and you'll be amazed at the number of God, times God tells us to have courage. Again and again you'll see it. It says be strong and courageous. But do you see the source of that? What is the source of Joshua's strength and courage? It's God's presence. What did God tell him? Look at the very end. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Why? Because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wherever you go, it goes with you. He says it again and again. I'm with you. And guess what? We have that promise. That's ours. God is with you. If you call yourself Christian, God abides and dwells in you and is with you wherever you go. Wow. Wherever we go, whatever we do, God makes that possible through the presence of his Holy Spirit. You don't ever need to walk alone, even, even when you feel like it. The fact of the matter is, you're not alone. Life gets hard. 
And at times you feel abandoned and rejected and neglected and forgotten, but the fact is you're never alone. Feelings are liars. That's a fact. Feelings are liars. Far too often we're led by our feelings rather than by the truth. Now let's choose, brothers and sisters, to live by the truth, not by our feelings. And if you choose and set your mind to do that, to live by the truth of God's word and not by your feelings, in time you will lead your feelings. You can and you will lead your feelings. You can bring those lying feelings into line with truth. You can and you must. God also instructs Joshua to not turn from the law that he'd given to Moses. He says, don't go to the left, don't go to the right, hold fast to what you were given. Now again, church, what have you been given? You've been blessed with the whole of the word of God. And he's saying, don't go to the left, don't go to the right. Again, read the word with the intent to apply it. As our pastor has often taught us, all of this is God's word. What does he say? From Genesis to maps. It's all ours. It's all God's word, every bit of it. And we're not to read it just to feel good. We're not looking for a feel-good mindset. We're reading it to put it into action. Don't miss God's promise at the end of verse 7 and 8. What does he tell Joshua? If you do this, you will have what? You'll prosper and have what kind of success? Good success. Prosperity and success. Does it get any better than that? Now go back to Paul's goal for a minute in his letter to the Philippians. Prosperity and success don't get any better than laying hold of that for which Jesus Christ has laid hold of you. That's what we're after. Eternity with him. That's prosperity. That's success. I think of Peter when, when, when he asked Jesus. Peter initiated that conversation when Jesus came walking on the water. Peter started and said, Lord, if it's really it's you, call me to come to you. And Jesus said, come on. So what did Peter do? He got up out of the boat and began to walk on water. And as long as Peter's eyes were fixed on Jesus, he was doing just fine. It's when Peter's focus shifted, I don't know if it was to the right or the left, but it wasn't straight ahead anymore. He looked to the right or the left to the storm that was swirling around him. There were winds and there were waves and probably thunder and lightning. He began to look at them. That's when he began to sink. In church, that's our problem today. We listen to the situation. We look at the storm, at the trial, at the struggle, instead of our God. We run to God and say, God, look how big my problems are. What about if we run to the problem and say, look how big my God is? Let's turn that for a minute. Is our God truly able can our God meet any need? Can our God heal or fix any situation? I get some whispered yeses, but I don't get a resounding yes. I pray that you will get that in your mind that, yeah, my God is bigger than the situation. And my God has what is my best in mind at all times. Not what I want. Sometimes I stomp my little feet. I want. And God says, you may want, but it's not in your best, so child, no. No. How many of us are parents have told our kids, no. Catherine smiles because she knows she's heard no more than a few times. I won't give her whatever she wants. I'll give her what's for her best because I love her. God is the same with an even more pure love. God will give you just what you need, just when you need it. And if he's not giving you what you want, then you've got to step back and say, hmm, what's he doing? It's got to be for my greater good. If I trust that he loves me the way he says he does, then it's got to be for my greater good. Life is full of problems, and there are enough and ample opportunities for us to shift our focus off of Christ and onto the situation. But gosh, it short circuits things. It circumvents the work that God wants to be doing in our life. It cuts it short. You know, these, these, we have to view everything through Christ. 
Our eyes have got to be constantly on Christ. Everything viewed through Christ. Every trial, every struggle viewed through Christ. What's God doing? Is it for my greater good? Keeping my eye on the goal, the trials, the heartaches, the failures, they can all be put into right perspective when they're seen through God. They've got to be seen through God. They're opportunities for our redemptive God to do an incredible work beyond what we ask or imagine. You might be right in the pit, right in the, the, the heart of a struggle right now. And God's right there with you, allowing you to have that struggle for a purpose. God does nothing without a reason. God allows nothing without a reason. Maybe we need to retrain ourselves to begin to ask God, what are you doing? What are you doing? We have a redemptive God who's always working things out for our greater good. This world that's so very real, with all of its intensity and all of its great emotions and experience, guys, it's temporal. It's fleeting. Tick, 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 tick. The, the earth's moments are numbered. Eternity is forever and ever and ever and ever. This stuff is for now. Yes, it's real, but it's nothing compared to eternity. It's just a moment. I can endure anything for a moment knowing what's coming when I see it through Christ. It's how am I viewing it? Now, I'm not saying that we're so heavenly minded we're of no earthly good. I am not saying that. We have got to operate in both realms. We operate with our feet firmly planted on terra firma, but our hearts and our minds focused on God, focused on eternity. The underlying theme of our life, the motivation for everything we do, the motivation for every word we speak should be Jesus Christ, should be our Lord and Savior. We're to take him into our daily lives, not leave him in our prayer closet. Every morning I get up and I spend some time alone with the Lord. And then I've got to get up and get about my day. And if I'm wise, I ask him to come along. He's not like the, the charger for my phone, which stays by the chair. I don't take my charger with me. I charge it in the morning and I go in faith that I've got the, my phone's got what it needs for the day. But I don't need that. But where God's concerned, I take him with me because I do need him. Because to tell you what, I can't get from the family room to the kitchen without having a thought. That's not of him. So I need him with me in every situation. The people that we encounter, the decisions that we make, the challenges and the trials that we meet, everything should be viewed through Christ. He should be our very breath, our every thought. Maybe we should train ourselves to ask those questions I was saying earlier. What God? Why God? Where God? How God? When God? And not asking them with a clenched fist, saying, God, why? But, God, why? What are you doing? Because, God, I long to participate with you. What are you doing in this situation that I might understand what you're doing, that I might participate with you in it, that I might be more readily obedient? Now, sometimes God says, I'm not telling, because I want you in faith to trust me. Trust me that I've got this. Show me you love me by trusting me. Isn't that what love is? Trust. And the deeper in love you become with somebody, or the deeper in love you grow, the trust is what makes it grow. That's reality. That's, that's normal relationship growing. We're more likely to succeed in observing to do according to all that's written in God's word if we have a heart open to him. Now, in closing this morning, I would say to you, I have no idea how the game next week is going to turn out. I have no predictions. 
I have thoughts, but the thoughts I've had so far have gone wrong, and that's okay. I think that both teams have done everything they can to prepare themselves. They've applied the tools. They've established a foundation for success. But my greater concern is you. I really don't care what happens next week, to be honest. Because no matter who wins, it makes no impact on my life. I'm not richer or poorer. Nobody who means the world to me is happier or sadder. Well, maybe. <laughs> but you, you, beloved, I really do care about you. I am concerned about you and your walk with Christ. I am concerned that you are able to go the distance. How is it going to turn out for you? Do you have personally, have you taken to yourself the skill set that you need to go the distance? And my departing challenge this morning is found in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, we also, we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let's lay aside every weight. Let's lay aside the sin which so easily ensnares or entangles us and let us run with endurance. Let's go the distance in this race that's set before us. Look at Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and having obtained, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. If you're a believer, you have your foundation. Your foundation is Jesus Christ. The question is, are you building your life on him day by day, moment by moment? This journey is a daily walk. We choose one day at a time, sometimes one moment at a time, pick up one foot and put it down. Pick up the other foot and put it down in faith in allegiance to Christ, one step at a time, walking secure in the knowledge, secure in the knowledge that Jesus Christ has done everything necessary for my salvation. I need to do nothing but willingly accept what he's done for me and then live my life based on that relationship. I have to live like I'm saved. I have to behave in such a way that shows I know him in whom I have believed. It's kind of like when I got married. I wasn't single anymore. I'll tell you a funny story. I woke up the morning after we got married and I was having breakfast with John. And I happened to glance at his hand and I saw a wedding ring on his hand. And for just a freak, freakish moment, I thought, ah, I'm with a married man. <laughs> That's the thought I had. And I told him, and he laughed and said, well, I'm with a married woman. It's like, that's true. But what I realized is I had to begin to act like I was married. I had to stop doing what I, as a single person, had been doing. Going where I want, hanging with who I wanted to hang, and not answering to anybody. All of a sudden, there was this expectation that I'd behave in a different way because I had aligned myself, covenanted myself, made faith with another person. The same is true of our walk with Christ. When we've bowed the knee, we stand up with a new identity. We're Christians. We have salvation, and we have to begin to act like it. We have to begin to walk like it, and think like it, and, and talk, and, 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 and live, and behave in such a way that shows I know him in whom I have believed. We're always to look to Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. You have the tools available to you. Everything you need to go the distance is yours. The only question is, will you use them? Will you use them? Are you determined to go the distance? Will you finish strong? Some of you more than others, I'm going to get in your face and I'm going to ask you that question. I've asked my children that question when they were younger. I got right in their face and I held their little face and said, promise me I'll see you in heaven. Promise me. Covenant. Commit. 
that I see you. I love you. Don't want one of you lost. Are you willing to go the distance? Are you determined? In Philippians 1.6, Paul teaches and he says that God, who has begun a good work in you, will perfect or complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. He has entered covenant with you. My question, church, is will you finish strong in him? Will you put your hand in his hand and hold on for dear life that you might go the distance? That's my challenge and that's my prayer for you today. I don't know all of you here this morning. I see faces I've never seen before and I hope to get a chance to shake your hand. And I don't know where you are with the Lord. Maybe you've never had an opportunity to meet Jesus Christ. What a great opportunity today is. If you don't know Jesus, if you have not come to that place where you say, yeah, I want that salvation you talked about. I want that security you talked about. If that's a desire of your heart, just raise your hands that I can pray with you. Okay? Brothers and sisters, those I know and those I don't, if you find yourself needing a booster shot, spiritually speaking, to enable you to go the distance. The altars are open this morning. There is nothing we cannot pray for. There's nothing that we will not pray with you for to address. If you have a need or a struggle, Paul was saying earlier, we've got to let that sin that so easily entangles us, those little things that grab around our ankle that want to pull us back into the world. If you've got those things hanging on you, and you want to sever them today, I'd be more than happy to pray with you this morning. So if you have a prayer need, come and we will pray together. We won't be shy.